about it, is that it allows to query the Nomad archive. And in this video, I will demonstrate how to do this in practice, and will show you how, how to, uh, an example of machine learning analysis on data just retrieved from the Nomad archive. Starting from the main page of the Nomad AI Toolkit that you can see now on the screen, you can click on the Query the Archive button. And this will redress to a Jupyter notebook that will demonstrate how to query the archive. And uh, we'll also see an example of machine learning analysis. The first step is to import all the packages that are going to be used in this notebook. So we can see here things as Pandas, it is uh, the most common data science Python library, and also SQLearn, it contains most of the most popular machine learning uh, methodologies. Here we import all the Python packages that are uh, um, allows to query, to interact with the Nomad API. And all these packages are all already available and installed in the Nomad AI Toolkit. Here, okay. I okay. Try not to. It's better. Better oh. now. Is it better? Oh, okay. So that the one has to optimize. Okay. Uh, no, do not optimize the video. Okay. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> one second. One second, Perfect. and I. I have a little bit of okay, good. We also import the atomic features package. This will give you uh, all the atomic properties that we will use in our machine learning analysis. And the reason is that one of the um, main goals of performing machine learning analysis um, on material science is that we would like to predict materials property given the atomic composition and atomic features of the material. And here we are going to have, we are going to take all the atomic features that will be used in our analysis. So in this heat map, we can see uh, the values of uh, here, the feature we are analyzing is the atomic number that is the most trivial. And you can see how the change, it changes the color in the, uh, as the, with the periodic table. But then we can also take other properties, uh, as for example, the ionic potential. And then uh, if we hover over the elements, we can see the value of the ionic potential. If you are more curious to know how these data are obtained and uh, all the functionalities that are included in the atomic features package, I will uh, recommend you to visit the AI toolkit and uh, uh, go through uh, a tutorial that explains how it is, this package is structured. Okay, so now let's go back to our query. In this cell, we define all the query parameters of our query. And we can see that we are uh, asking that all, uh, all simulations, all the materials that we are going to retrieve were obtained using the VASM code. We also asked uh, uh, all materials that contain oxygen, that the crystal system is cubic, that materials are ternary, uh, so contains only three different elements, that the X chain, that the XC functional is the GGA, and then this is also very important, we are ensuring that uh, simulations have converged. So we have this geometry optimization, and we are essentially uh, asking that all simulations retrieved uh, have converged within this value of uh, to, the, uh, power, uh, to the 10 minus 22 uh, in Joule. But so now, uh, you might demand how to obtain this script here. Well, this is something that you can get from uh, uh, using a GUI that is accessible from the nomadlab.eu website. As you are currently using the uh, version one of the Nomad API, you firstly should go here and access the, the newer API version. And, uh, um, and from here, you can obtain, make your, uh, your query using GUI that is accessible from Explorer entries. So here we define our query essentially. Um, as a first thing, you can see that we have initially all materials that are 12 over 12 million, so that are all the entries in our Nomad um, archive. And then here we start making selections. So we see 
uh, that um, oxygen, we, we ask that there is oxygen in uh, our query, so each material should contain oxygen. And then we also demand that uh, materials are ternary, so at most three elements and at minimum also three elements. And now we already see that we are less, we have less than a million different results. Then we keep with our query, so we say here uh, that um, the system is cubic. The code uses VASP and the GGA functional. And then we also uh, demand mm -hmm. that simulations have converged. Here we have electron volts, but we are working with Joule, so we change the units. And uh, uh, we simply put here 2 minus 22, and that's our query. You see that now we have over, almost 9,000 results. What is really interesting about uh, this is that we can also check the author and uh, the origin. And we can see that this came from three different databases, the Materials Project, AFRO, and OQMD. And this is something uh, that is very uh, specific of the Nomadea Toolkit. It is, uh, is the largest uh, material science database and uh, uh, it has very heterogeneous sources of code, of uploaders. From, this snip, uh, from here we can access the, the snippet code that we use. So clicking on that button we have this code and this is essentially what was defined in our query. So you simply then have to copy paste this and putting it here and that's how we define this query variable then here below we have some required field required essentially says what is going to be retrieved from the query so we see that we have things as the space group number and uh, the final energy difference of the geometry optimization camera composition the, and the position of the atoms this is part of this workflow section so it means that these positions of the atoms are the position of the atoms and the simulations that has finally converged so now how we can uh, identify uh, what kind of um, entries to retrieve. Again, coming back from uh, um, the Nomad Lab webpage, in the, uh, again in uh, uh, our API 1, we can have here the um, access the Nomad Menta Info. And here we have the schema that is used to store all values. So results give the, um, so from entry, so each entry is the basis. And then we have things as results uh, that gives an overview of all the results. And then we, we said that we were looking for the, the space group number, which is this one here. Then again, we can also access the workflow, which is uh, then pointing to, uh, if we take calculation results and reference section, and then we go to the base calculation. It, it is pointing to the calculation, this base calculation, that has converged in our simulation. And from here, then we can access the values as uh, that we retrieved from system ref are the, uh, the, the, the about the system. Um, so here the atoms position and uh, uh, the chemical composition, but then you can also find here things as the energy, forces, stress, and uh, all possible entries and values that can be computing with the DFT simulations. So here we, uh, we def decide what kind of entries to, to retrieve. So um, I would like to mention we uh, chose the space group number. This is always an interesting quantity to study for materials. And then the atoms positions and lattice vectors, which will allow us to compute the atomic density of the material. So the atomic density will be the target property, a material's property we will study as a function of the atomistic composition, because the atomic concentration is something that depends on the interatomic uh, interactions of the material. And this is something that is not trivial to compute, given solely the atomistic composition. And we would like to create a machine learning model that is capable of doing this. Then we, we set here the max entries, that is 9,000, a bit more than what we've seen before. More than, this is just a limit that is used for security reasons. And then page size that uh, essentially says how many entries are retrieved at each API call. And then we fetch our query. We define some uh, scale factor that is used for numerical stability as we change 
um, our um, values the, the, in our uh, reference system because you want to work on machine learning uh, with uh, values that are too small for uh, convergence. And uh, here, uh, in this, in, in this uh, cell here, we define, we construct the pandas data frame that will be the basis of the, the analysis. So we query, we download the query. Um, and then we, um, here we, uh, we perform a lazy uh, query. So step after step with this entry is retrieving data from results. It is here. So then uh, here we, we essentially uh, creating this variable that contains all the, the, the values defined in the required field. And then this, for example, will allow us to, um, to compute the atomic density. And in, in this script here, we create a file that stores the atomic position of the simulation that has converged. And this is something that will be used by the visualizer to make a visual inspection of the material that is studied. Then we label the, uh, the elements in our material. As we said, we have three different elements. We have oxygen and uh, two more, uh, which are the label A and B. This one then will be used by the Atomic Features Library for, uh, um, for retrieving the uh, element-specific uh, atomic um, properties that will be used for during the machine learning. Analysis. Then here we have the, the stoichiometric ratio of the material. And then we take all these uh, elements and values that we compute and retrieved uh, to fill uh, um, an entry of the pandas data frame, step after step in this for a loop. So we have things that are taken from the atomic features package as the link energy of the element A and B, and then things that we also just retrieved from the Nomad archive, from as for example, uh, the space group number or the atomic density that we also computed from the lattice vectors. So as this, this query can take uh, um, some minutes, we, we skip over it and we just use some cache data that are um, saying that it worked. So this pandas data frame that starts with this query is already cached. We uh, give a brief um, we take a look at this, how it is structured, this pandas data frame using the describe function. And then we start analyzing the, uh, the uh, values the, that are more interesting for us. It is a space group number, so uh, in this histogram. And we see that, in fact, we, we only have mainly two different space group numbers, 221 and 227, and many other that are almost irrelevant. This is something interesting we would like to understand better about this composition. And then we also analyze uh, the um, atomic density. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that we have uh, quite some spread values, almost like a Gaussian, you might see, which is also involves, uh, as the values are not too big around the value, that probably uh, this machine learning analysis is not too trivial. As all these values were uploaded by many different people, and uh, they were all using different um, parameters for the queries, we might have the same material that has been simulated by different person, different settings of the computational uh, simulation. Um, but still, we would like to have one entry for each material. So what we do, we average for all these materials that have the same chemical composition, we average our target pro properties, that is the atomic density. And then to get like a reduced uh, uh, pandas data frame, that is the F group here. So now we can go, uh, we can finally make our clustering analysis. Um, in this case, we are using the HDB scan clustering algorithm, and which finds here two clusters. And, uh, and then we reduce our, um, and here we reduce, uh, we make, we use also some dimensional reduction algorithm, UMAP, to reduce the, uh, the space onto a two-dimensional space. So here we see that we've taken seven features. So we are in a seven-dimensional uh, space. And this is something we cannot visualize. We cannot make a visual inspection of such a, uh, of such a space. And this is something we might uh, want to uh, have. This is something that can help us. So here we are using HDB scan for uh, clustering. And if you're curious more about clustering, I re really recommend it to, to, to go through uh, our introduction to clustering notebook in the AI toolkit. 
And uh, this HDB scan, uh, which is also explained in this notebook, it is a clustering algorithm that is uh, able to uh, identify outliers and removing uh, 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 these outliers, it's able to create some classes that are more distinct. So cluster analysis, what it's doing is, uh, is finding some groups of elements, of materials, that in our seven-dimensional feature space are somewhat close to each other. So we would like to, have, to see some materials where all of them are similar to each other that are different to other groups of materials. And uh, uh, this HDB scan is um, capable of uh, finding these clusters. But then we also would like not only to know, here we see that we have two clusters, we would like not only to, to see how many clusters and then have, making some quantitative analysis on it, we also would like to visualize it on a two-dimensional map, because this is something very useful. We will see why now. And, uh, um, and we see UMAP, which is a recent algorithm, uh, that allows to, um, to project uh, uh, this larger space, a dimensional space on a two-dimensional embedding, trying to preserve the relative distance. And now we can visualize our data in, using our visualizer. So here we have some color features that we will see what this what will be about soon with atomic density and space group number, and then over features where we have things as the atomic number and space group number. And this is something that you can also change. <clears throat> so here, this is our uh, the results. So we can see that in fact we have two groups of materials. So here the colors are the different classes, and we see that in fact the clusters that were identified by HDB scan are so most distinct also by UMAP. And those are two different techniques that found this. So and this is interesting because it is uh, corroborate gives more strength to this identification. If you look at outliers. Then we see um, that, in fact, there is another cluster of elements here that are um, not identified as a cluster, but just as outliers. And this is also the difference of just like looking at the map and making clustering on a seven-dimensional space and then projecting. So you see that making the clustering in the seven-dimensional space allows to find the cluster, and then we can visualize on a two-dimensional map that can give misleading results. So we might think that this is some, some elements that have some similarities in a high-dimensional space, but maybe they're not. They're just an artifact of the two-dimensional projection. But so now we would like also to see how, um, what is, what are these clusters about? And then if we look at the space group number, it is interesting to see that the two clusters have essentially different values. So here we hover over the data set and we see that the space group number 227, and this is for pretty much all these points, the, the, the yellow color, while the green color here has uh, space group number 221. This is something uh, that we will uh, see more depth later. Uh, another feature of uh, this um, uh, visualize is that also we can decide the fraction of elements that are visualized. This is because we don't want to visualize too many points which are heavy to load. Then if we click on a point, we can make a visual inspection of the material, as you can see here. And also the other way around, so you can also select a material here, for example, um, you might want to have something, you might, you, you can, and then you can display it, and then you, you find it here. So this is, this is this cross, is this one here, it appears also on the map. So, and then you can also, if you click here and click on this other, you can see another uh, this structure, and this allows to inspect one after the, the other all the uh, materials. Then, if you click on this button here, we have a number of tools for creating high-quality plots, and we'll invite you to explore all this functionality. And then you you can print it with also scale that it identifies the resolution of your plot. And this will uh, uh, then allow you to, to download uh, in uh, the format that you desire your, uh, your data set. And, and that you can see it here now. Now let's come back to our analysis. And uh, um, now we would like to see um, the, how the, the clusters are composed. We can see that most of the clusters here they have, in fact, Two different values 221 and 227 
and if we look in more uh, in uh, more depth we can see that with this pie chart that in fact are almost all composed like one cluster by space group 227 and the other 221 if we make the same analysis on the outliers we will see that not only there are both in uh, uh, none of them is real in majority in respect to the other but there are many many more of all the others so it's able to to take all these values out the the clustering algorithm this is interesting because it uh, it shows that uh, the, the space group number is somehow also a result of the chemical composition of the material because when we are done this analysis, this uh, exploratory analysis, we didn't put the information, the space group number, uh, as the uh, input uh, of the machine learning model. And so this involves, it must be some correlation between the chemical composition and the space group number, this is a material property. So now we, we uh, are finally making our machine learning analysis, and here are the, the features that are selected for, uh, this is the atomic uh, features that you can see are only um, atomic features. And this will be uh, used to compute the atomic density. This is a material property. This is the target feature. And uh, um, we divide the test set and train set with a, a difference of 0 0.2. And finally, we can, uh, um, make use random forest and if you're curious about random forest we also have a dedicated notebook that explains in detail how random forest works and we can see this is the accuracy we have in the test set and the train set which is quite a good accuracy so we i would like to mention that on test set it means that uh, uh, the machine learning model was not trained on that test set and then we make prediction on data that is unknown to the uh, to the model but we already know the results of the um, of the density of the material. And then finally, we would like also to have a final representation. And in this graph, um, in this graph, we can see that we have some air prediction reference value. So now I will explain you what this means. We knew, we know that we have uh, three different elements. We have oxygen and uh, two more. So what we have on the x-axis is the um, one um, element, and then we, we take the average over all the other values. So we have A, that is, for example, uh, atomic uh, number 3, and then we make the average over all the other uh, uh, second element B in the, uh, our ternary material. Then we have a mean and then some variance, of course, of the atomic density. The same was done with reference values, so the, the values that were uh, old, um, uh, that uh, were used for training the model, and then also on the AI prediction, that is just the prediction of our model on the test set. And we can see not only that we have quite some good agreement in the mean and the variance, but also something interesting that we see is that we have some trends that follow the periodic table. So this again, it means that this atomic density can be correlated to some chemical properties of the other material that are uh, um, in the material uh, with the oxygen. So now this was all. Uh, I really hope that you uh, learn how to, to uh, perform machine learning analysis on data that were queried from the Nomad archive. And this will inspire you for next uh, applications of uh, the AI toolkit for your own project and uh, um, this was all thank you for the attention okay so this can, you can hear me the continuation of the video is the the link that I gave uh, this morning uh, about uh, the installation of the local uh, app, uh, what it is and how to install it. Um, okay, let me thank uh, Luigi, who is again in, in the audience, but uh, okay, we just uh, recorded this a, a while ago. I have to uh, show a little thing because in the meanwhile, uh, there was a little update on the on the web server. Nothing that you cannot understand by yourself. But let me find it. Okay, now I share again the screen. So 
nomadlab.eu currently um, uh, okay now you see the screen i guess differently from what was shown um, i guess it was one month ago or no two months ago now we have a 1.1 version and the version that uh, uh, luigi was talking about uh, can be reached uh, via calculations here or here is the same so this uh, will lead you to exactly the same version that uh, uh, luigi shows in the in the video uh, then one can perform the query and um, and um, and then uh, copy paste, let's say, the, the, the query into the notebook. Uh, then I wanted to mention uh, the notebooks that uh, Luigi has already mentioned in the video. Uh, so essentially, as I, as I already said, uh, no, what is it here? So you access from view tutorials, you see, this uh, menu and you would have, um, one second, no, not this one, I'm sorry. Okay, let me just click then, much faster. So this is the menu that uh, has the uh, basic tutorials, except that of course it takes a second to upload. And uh, we have, uh, so Luigi mentioned, uh, this random forest is part of the decision tree uh, um, tutorial, but I mean, you don't have to just wander, uh, you, you type random forest here and you find that it is this one. Uh, and also this one that is exactly what uh, the, the notebook that uh, Luigi has shown until now. So our metadata worked perfectly, I'm very proud of that. And then um, the other, uh, things that uh, Luigi showed, then let's exploit the, it's about clustering. So you have, uh, again, the querying the Nomad Archive notebook, but you have a very nice uh, tutorial on introduction to clustering and in a more general on uh, introduction to exploratory analysis that has more, most, uh, both clustering and dimension reduction. Uh, that follows a little bit what was shown in, in this also this notebook, but it goes tutorially into the method. So here they are applied. There is no much explanation of what they mean. Um, and uh, but here you would have the, the full tutorial. Now um, this is essentially it for what uh, uh, I, uh, including Luigi, <laughs> want to say. Um, and now it is up to you. Uh, meaning that uh, our suggestion is that you go to the let me see, I have it open somewhere. No, no I, have to, I can't really open it. Um, nope. Okay, let me open it, no problem. I think I have prepared it, but so from here, go to query the archive and you will have the notebook that Luigi has, has presented. If you want to, um, watch again a little bit uh, what uh, uh, Luigi has, uh, has shown. Uh, now you just, uh -huh, more chat here. But I need to delete the, the minute here. Okay, so this is the link to the, to the video that you can rewatch at will. Uh, but of course, uh, you can also ask uh, uh, us now. So my suggestion is that you, yeah. Um, that you open this notebook and you start, uh, yeah, first of all, run the, the cells. There is one caveat. Um, um, I think Luigi mentioned in the video, uh, this cell here, is this one, yes. Uh, you may not want to run it unless you want to wait uh, uh, some minutes before it, you get the data. So we have a version here of the, 
of the same data that are retrieved from the, the, the archive. If you run this cell, it reads a, a local um, file that has already the, the data frame. Um, okay, uh, Luca, please, could you wait? Could you wait and hold on so that I go um, line by line, page by page, and be on the same page as you are? So I think the first thing is we need to register, right? Uh, you do don't need to, you don't need to register if you just click the notebook query the archive you you can immediately run it okay uh, okay so we should go to normal nomad so the, the files Hello? yeah okay you you can go directly to this link that i think i put into the chat already yes it was uh, at the beginning of my yeah. So I, I can put it again. Okay. If somebody just connected because yeah, the chat is not retroactive. So from the, the link uh, Nomad Lab AI Toolkit, you land to this page. And if you click query the archive, after a few seconds, you will see this notebook appearing in your browser. Sorry, please give us a minute. I want to yes. be able to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much more to say. So essentially the notebook should be a self-explanatory. Uh, I wouldn't just to point out that there is a specific cell that retrieves the data from the archive that could take a while, but otherwise just feel free to go through and, uh, and Luigi and or I will react to your questions. Okay. Uh, sorry, please hold on. Everybody can see this, right? Yes. Okay. So you can navigate to the place on your laptop or your computer. Right? So no much dash left. So the in a way this uh, say view tutorial uh, environment or even more the uh, AI virtual course is an extended hands-on uh, session in the sense that you, you know, the tutorial course, uh, the virtual course could, could occupy easily a week <laughs> in, um, of your time. And uh, the, the tutorials uh, probably more. So I wanted to focus on, uh, on this one because it gives access, it explains, uh, so all notebooks have access to the data in the archive, but it explains how to do it and shows a kind of a simple uh, query, uh, okay. still relatively meaningful. Yes. Okay, so once we are on the AI toolkit, we should go to query the archive, right? Yes, here. So when you are on this page, go to query the archive. There. The first time may take uh, maybe 10, 15 seconds to upload. You should, you should go on this page. Then after that, you query the archive. So let's see. Yeah, after that. Yeah, you should see archive. All right. And then, yeah, so you, you click this, you see 
this appearing hopefully let me know if there is any problem and then uh, then it is a python notebook so you you can read run the cells and they should uh, all work without problem yes. Yeah, yeah, I want to call. You're efficient. Sorry, Luca, my internet is slow, but we'll get there. So please be patient. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you see this page, it, it, you essentially can go by yourself. Uh, uh, the the um, notebook uh, is meant to be self-explanatory. My idea was to have you go through and, and ask questions if you have uh, any. I don't think that now, I mean, Luigi in the video already went through this notebook. I don't think it's useful now to go through again. I wanted you to try and, and see what happens. So is anybody able to run uh, cells of the notebook? Yeah. Uh, we're still trying to, our internet is slow, so we're, our internet is slow, so we're still trying to get the notebook. Okay. I heard a yeah in the background. <laughs> so somebody is able to run. Yes, I have a question. Uh, Please. Um, I'm able to see the periodic table, but my yes. question is um, in most of the machine learning I see um, the, one of the package they use is this key science, um, sorry, let me get the name, science key. Thank you. Yeah, the science um, key learn. Is it, uh, is it the most reliable package or is there another one better than it? Science key learn? Yeah, science key learn. Maybe, circuit learn. Ah, scikit learn. Scikit, sorry, scikit learn. Okay, so scikit learn is a Python library for machine learning in general. Yeah, is it uh, the most reliable? Uh, let me say it so. is very reliable and it has a huge uh, number of, uh, um, let's say, tools, including, by the way, the CISO++ uh, package. So okay. uh, our developer, Tom Porcel, has uh, um, integrated uh, CISO++ into, into uh, Scikit learn. So by all means, yes, use Scikit learn. I'm not sure if in this, I think it is used because uh, yes, here. So you see, uh, yeah, all all these all these uh, um, packages are imported from Scikit learn. Okay. Right. So this is a very good uh, library for for uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, it doesn't contain all possible machine learning things. Uh, as I was saying in, in the lecture, you if you want to do neural network, for example, probably scikit learn has some neural network, but uh, it's not uh, the it's most not powerful. Sufficient. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you may want to go to some other uh, um, uh, yeah, like libraries like TensorFlow, for example. And we have a notebook on, on neural network where TensorFlow is used. So uh, yeah, in any case, uh, yes, the SK learner, scikit learner uh, uh, is uh, is a uh, very extensive. So for uh, clustering, um, dimension reduction, kernel ridge regression, random forest, so all the decision tree methods for sure, uh, just go there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, you started with the periodic table. Uh, yes. This is something quite different in concept. This is a, a library of um, uh, atomic uh, features that can be used for uh, 
training model uh, like uh, with the, with CISO, with symbolic regression, or you could do coronary regression, decision tree, whatever you like. So these are a, a, a library of uh, of properties for each atom. So um, uh, for each uh, of the atom in the periodic table, you have a set of uh, properties that you can see listed here. Some of them may, may look mysterious. <laughs> I can explain if you want. Um, and in this particular case, what was uploaded here is a subset of these properties that is called DFT. Yeah, <laughs> that is, of course, DFT, we know, but it just means that it is a specific set that is calculated um, with the, the FHI AIMS code, so the code developed uh, uh, in the uh, Matthias Schaffer group, um, and goes over all the periodic table with different functionals and so on. Then uh, we uh, also, I've imported the uh, uh, PyMAT uh, from, from Matilda's project. So it's another set of, um, of um, uh, atomic features and uh, not documented here, but if you're interested, we have also uh, MagPy that is another uh, extensive set of uh, atomic features. So this is just to say that when you want to train a machine learning model, you need uh, features. Some of them you calculate it on the structure. Uh, if you have already heard, you may have, uh, I don't know, the SOAP descriptor. Uh, tomorrow, Gabor Shani will talk about the SOAP descriptor. We have notebooks in which we use the SOAP descriptor. That is a descriptor that is a function of the atomic positions. You may want to have other descriptors that are a function of uh, the chemical species that are in the material. And this is where you should go. Uh, you, you have this library of features here. Oh, this is a lot of information, but if, if you try uh, this, these packages, you, you will see how this works. In any case, you have already uh, the full worked out example here. Okay. Um, sorry, they said data was um, generated from VASP results. Is it from the XML file that those data has yeah. were gotten? Ah, um, XML file. Okay, it's a bit more complicated. Um, yeah, you're right. These are all screen to be VASP. Um, so, um, so this uh, I've seen Luigi showing that, that they come from uh, AFLO, um, materials uh, project, and and OQMD. So. All this file, all, all this information is contained in the Nomad archive. Uh, and, and the Nomad archive uh, reads uh, from the Nomad repository. Yeah, it's a little bit of nomenclature, but the Nomad repository contains the raw uh, VASP uh, uh, data, the raw VASP file. So whatever, yeah, the XML for sure, but also all the binary, uh, uh, all the postcard, whatever, I'm not an expert in VASP. Um, then uh, there is a, a, a parser. So there is a script that reads these files and transforms them into our internal representation okay. uh, that is independent of the original file. So when here, uh, the, so for example, the space group number is red. Uh, this is some calculation that we do on top of the atomic structure. So not necessarily the space group is an information that you have in the input and output of the code, maybe in this case, yes, but not necessarily. And it is calculated automatically by our parser uh, and so on. So all this uh, keyword uh, are our internal representation, our metadata in our internal representation. And to know about this, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, a, a full, uh, uh, not, not even a hands-on lecture, but a full workshop in itself. Let me just go to the, yes. So here. So, okay, to arrive here means, okay, Nomad, Nomad Lab EU, Nomad Lab EU, uh, Calculations, yeah, maybe there is a shortcut, but this is the you know, kind of full uh, way. And then uh, here, when you are, this is the, the browser, 
uh, and then in analyze you have the uh, how the um, metadata work. So uh, let's say that uh, yeah, I'm going a bit fast, but this is really a dedicated workshop. Um, in uh, if you want to access uh, atomic structure, you you have to use this kind of uh, uh, label in the in the notebook. So let me see. Here you have uh, yeah label species, selected vectors. These are all in the here. So you, uh, I mean, I'm just giving you uh, an entry point. Uh, that, that there is no way that I can show all this in uh, in, in few minutes, but. Uh, so we have uh, this internal representation that is independent of the code. So if you have calculation done with FHI aims or um, quantum express or and, and other codes, they, they will be represented in this same way instead of just in just the XML of um, of BASP. Uh, I should put another link because it's clear that all this information cannot really be digested on the fly, but we have a lot of uh, material for learning these things. Now I have to find it quickly. One second. Oh, it would be... The repetition results this one. So, link in the chat. So, you will find the material. PDF slide and, and, and YouTube videos that introduce how the overall nomad uh, infrastructure is, is done, including how to look into the uh, API and so on. So how to do searches and, and so on. It is not a huge amount of material, uh, but uh, yeah, it will require probably an afternoon to go through. So, Lucas, so far we only have five person who managed to uh, download completely the notebook. So, you have to be patient. No, I think I, okay. I downloaded it. So, did I downloaded it. Download the copy. Yeah, I downloaded it. And what I just did. So if you are downloading a copy directly from the website, you need to have the, the environment set up to run it on a local map. It's not free. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 yeah, um, are this uh, notebook running on Nomad server when you open them? Yes. Okay. Um, what is the format of the return query? Is it a JSON? Uh, yes. 
Uh, I mean, when you perform a query, yes, the Luigi, it, it's a JSON file, right? Right. Okay. So if you like, you can download the result of the query and uh, use it separately on your own. Ah, yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay, but then, yeah, I wanted okay. to, to tell you that you don't need to do the query. The query is already pre-run. So, yeah, this is when I, so this, oh, sorry, this you, you don't see, one second, sure. Okay, so if you see anywhere uh, on your screen what I'm sharing, you have a cell that starts with results equal query download. I think we are seeing it now. Yes. You yes. don't need to write this, to run this one. Actually, probably you shouldn't. Uh, you just run the next cell. It's, it's written if you read the, the, the notebook, but you just run this one, and this contains the result of the query. Actually, this is already okay. double frame. It's, it's even better than JSON. It's, it's a dedicated file. Luca, can you hear me? Yes. So, so, so the, yes. we have a problem here because given that your notebooks are online, as soon as the connection is broken, which happens basically every five minutes here, uh, the people get disconnected from the notebook. And okay. so they start from scratch. And so it's a fight again, one against the other to, to get the access. So wouldn't it make uh, sense? that you go through the line so you could show on the screen what, what you are doing because otherwise the people will not be able uh, to run. Yes, but okay, yes. So, um, essentially, but, so this is, is, is fully covered by the, the video that I have shown. So, okay, okay then I mean, you're gonna... we, we have, uh, but I'm going through, no problem. So I have this, uh, so initially there is some uh, initialization, import uh, packages and so on. Then there is this uh, connection to um, the atomic feature package that uh, uploads the, the, the atomic feature. And, and as an example, uh, we, we, should, we have shown them here uh, what we are actually uploading. And then you start initializing the query. I'm going fast because this part is essentially nothing, nothing interesting. Uh, so the, the important thing is that you should avoid to run this uh, uh, cell that I have put it now. So this is for completeness that you can really run it, uh, fetching the data from the archive but the result of the query is already pre-stored and you just run this uh, cell here and then generate it on the data frame. And then you start seeing some statistics of uh, what you have uh, uploaded. So here I'm really running the cells without uh, doing anything. So my suggestion would be that you use the, the video as a, as a guideline and, and, uh, and go through the, uh, the, the notebook. Uh, uh, so to my understanding, even if you lose the connection, the moment you get again the connection, you, you, you can continue. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I, I could also continue notebooks yeah. after going from my office to, to home. So the overall uh, a notebook is structured such that you can run it without doing anything. So there are no 
incomplete cells that you have to find out how to complete. Uh, the idea is that you run it to understand what's going on. And then if you want to do something else. Okay, in way I see how to organize it better next time. So the, the, we have this local app that I have uh, kind of uh, advertised this morning. And in that case, you need still quite some band to download the 15 gigabyte, but you may also download it only once and then share. Okay. Okay, uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. I'm, uh, I'm back again. We are uh, discussing when uh, I think Jamalco interrupted a little. Um, about this uh, query, when you query, are you querying from the archive or you are querying from an active database? Uh, so the archive is a database. Yeah, what I mean is that, is it uh, actively been uh, updated or it just has been uh, maybe put uh, aside as an archive that uh, it's uh, no, 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 yeah. it can only be accessed? This archive is really uh, the nomad archive. So this is uh, the database where all the data that are uploaded uh, to, to nomad uh, can be found. So it is constantly updated, constantly meaning, I don't know, every okay. Okay. few okay. days there is a new version. Updated yes. Constantly. yes. Okay, okay, okay. So if I check it now, maybe after a month or so, I may likely find out that that has been increasing size so definitely. Exactly. And you can also upload your data <laughs> and, and, and you can find them okay. as well as others. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, yes, I hello, hello. Uh, 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 thank you very much for very nice talk. I want to ask very fundamental question. Uh, last lecture, you spoke about the types of machine learning and deep learnings, and yes. there are uh, supervised and unsupervised. Uh, I hear about type of learning. Those are uh, self-learning, and another is uh, uh, reinforced learning. Yes. Um, is, is how to, to define those type of... Uh, okay, so reinforcement learning is considered 
sometimes uh, uh, kind of different category uh, than uh, supervised learning. And it has quite some literature behind. So these are learning algorithms uh, in which the, um, uh, yeah, the algorithm uh, finds out which new data points are needed in order to uh, improve the algorithm. Now, what Gianmarco has shown in his uh, uh, talk this afternoon, uh, this uh, Bayesian yes. learning uh, can be considered reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning has uh, the nomenclature of uh, exploration versus exploitation. So you start with few data points, you build a model, and then you try to find out where your model is supposedly weak uh, and, and you acquire new data points in the area where it is weak and so on and so forth. There are, and it, it, it developed it develop itself by itself? Precisely. Ideally, yeah. yes. You could, so, uh, yes? Look at the one, that, the one that I was showing, I would call it active learning. The reinforcement learning is the you know, thing that they do when uh, they learn to play Pac-Man or whatever. So the, the, bound, the, learning bound, the boundaries are very blurred. It's active learning and reinforcement learning are not distinct uh, if, you, if you browse literature. Are they same? Active learning or reinforcement learning? People try to call reinforcement learning a specific subclass of uh, active learning in which the data set is really built on the fly. So the typical example is uh, uh, machine uh, artificial intelligence um, tools that learn to play games and, and they play over and over games like uh, chess or go or whatever in order to to find out. Uh, uh, so it, it has a, a very special nomenclature with the updating policy and, uh, and, and, and all these uh, kind of things. But so it is a specific class of, uh, of, uh, of learning algorithm. Self-learning, if I understand correctly, is, is not yet uh, 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 real. So it's, it's a dream that, that there are algorithms that learn by themselves. So they are fully unsupervised in the sense that you start with some data points and then they completely uh, go by, by themselves uh, and, and learn everything, uh, doing uh, all kinds of uh, strategies. Uh, so typically all these um, uh, algorithms use deep learning one way or the other. They do not need to, it's just that deep learning is, is, is uh, flexible enough to support all these kind of um, uh, different uh, strategies. Uh, so even reinforcement learning uh, would require uh, at least a two hour lecture to, to, to really go through all the, the, uh, the several aspects. Uh, I mean, for the introduction, <laughs> it is really a, a huge field. And then you have a lot of uh, uh, yeah, recent development like this uh, adversarial network in which uh, actually there are two networks that try to trick each other uh, in order to uh, do the uh, their enforcement learning more and more uh, efficient. Um, so th th these things are, are quite advanced. Uh, they, they, they would need uh, uh, dedicated uh, lectures, but. In, I have seen a, a few papers already in uh, also material science that use reinforcement learning. Uh, there is, uh, in particular, uh, I'm typing in the in the chat. Uh, this guy from from Denmark has a couple of interesting papers in which they they use uh, uh, reinforcement learning to learn potential energy surface. I see a, a raised hand. I don't know. Uh, Ahmed is the same person that was speaking Shall now. Or? Okay. So, second? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, 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 I am. Ah, okay. okay. Yes, so it's, it's, it's the same person who speaks. Okay, okay. Good. Because I see the raised hand. So, okay, but I see that you are unmuted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, they use reinforced learning to do potential in that Yes, yes, there is a paper. I, I, I can fetch it one second. Um, so for example um, what is it mm. i put in chat this paper uh, probably this is the second paper yeah there is also this one So uh, okay, I, this one, I at least, it. these two, at least uh, you would see reinforcement learning projecting onto something probably familiar to you, because if you read the papers about uh, uh, games, huh? some things are a little bit unclear, honestly. <laughs> OK. Ah, OK, one second. Uh, what, I, what I one should consider yes. is that typically these, these methodologies are extremely expensive. <laughs> Because the, the machine, uh, <laughs> the, the algorithm, especially at the beginning, has no clue. Uh, so it tries to, to gather information about the, the environment in some sense. So it's exploring completely blindly. So typically, okay. Okay. I know that people are trying to combine it with the so-called priors. And this is where active learning and reinforcement learning talk to each other. Because as a, as a physicist, if you know what kind of space you are exploring, you start imposing a little bit of um, uh, yeah, conditions, uh, some, some symmetries, some, some invariance, uh, and, and also things that are blatantly impossible and the machine may take a while to understand. Luca, there's yes. someone who reached okay. 32 and has a problem with a key, atomic underscore density. Does that ring a bell? Uh, not really. Is there any chance to share the screen? <laughs> no. Maybe okay. Not. Thank you very much, Loka. You're Thank welcome. you very You're much. <laughs> Is there any chance to to share the screen and show the problem? Density. Or I can try to share, and if you tell me which cell, we can see if we can reach it. <laughs> yeah, the number of, of the cells, unfortunately, are not useful because they will change every time that you run it. Can you tell me which cell? Seems to be cell 32. But yeah, but that, the cells, the cell number changes every time you run it. So now I'm beyond 32, certainly. <laughs> you have to tell me, if, for example, if you can put in the chat the, 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 the first line of the cell, probably I can find it. Or even the first few characters. So, Luca, it's just after a, a paragraph that starts by using the visualizer, we can analyze the composition, something like that. Oops, one second. One second. I think it's right after that. Here? 
And it, it starts by using the visualizer, we can analyze the, the composition or something like that. Okay, here. And then these cells, so I don't know if now I have run everything. Let me see, probably not. No, can you go above that cell just to be sure that it's that? Where? Uh, yes, yeah, it's that one, the one that is number 56 in your case. So it works perfectly for you. Okay. Yeah. But you have to run everything above, include, except, except as I was saying, yeah. So if you upload, read people here, and then you, you have to run all of them. You cannot skip any. I mean, maybe some of them you can, but to be sure you have to run all of them. Because probably there is something defined in a, in a step, in a cell above, so that the cells are not self-contained. I mean, these graphs are the, the results of clustering. So clustering should be done clearly before to analyze yeah. the clusters. So for example, uh, yeah, embedding, uh, no clustering, yes, here, cluster label, this one, this one actually. So all these have to be run before. Yeah, so the general idea of, of a notebook is that uh, the cells might be uh, connected. So it's not given that if you just jump to a, a random cell, uh, things work. Typically, they will not. So this would, uh, yeah, it, it's plotting the, printing the frequency which a certain space group is found, yes. Thank you. 
So according to schedule, we are already in the coffee break, I think. I see that Michele Parinello is already mm -hmm. connected. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, we, we, are, we are essentially, we have this hands-on session, but uh, remotely done is a little bit tricky. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so in half an hour, should I start or? Yeah, I guess so, I'm not the yes. organizer, so, yeah, okay, here, sorry. <laughs> um, ciao, Michele. Ciao. This, this is Amolulu. Yeah. So in half an hour, yes. Or yeah. actually, twenty minutes. Okay. You 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 tell me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. No problem. I mean, I'm, uh, it's a shame I cannot be there with you guys, but uh, that's uh, life is uh, difficult these days. Yeah, but we hope next next year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll see you in a quarter of an hour. I start uh, putting up my slides and then uh, okay. I'll go. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you soon. Ciao. Ciao. Yeah. Sure. Ciao. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Luca, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Probably I, I'll send you an email with a, a summary of the links that have been used today. Yes, uh, this would be great. Because the, the, the general idea is that people can go through these uh, notebooks uh, whenever they want. Uh, and okay. then uh, if there is any problem at any time, just write uh, me, Luigi, an email, um, and uh, we will try to, to help uh, if there is any, any issue. So I, I, I will summarize a little bit these links and send you an email and then you can distribute to all the uh, participants. If you want to have a break, you go to have a break. So thank you all. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, Gianmarco for the local support. <laughs> Thank you. 
Non riesco a, a fare niente. Eh. 
cioè che faccio? Ah no, l'ha fatto. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Passo, okay. Sorry, sorry, no, perché no, no. si era bloccato poi. Cioè, faccio lo share screen. Share screen. Share. Ma è in mille mani questa, questa cosa qua, non so cosa fare. Questa? Esatto. Questa penso è la barra di zoom. Non so che non eh, lo so. Forse spero che tu non la vedi. No, penso noi non la vediamo, ah, perché quella è in senso proprio a fare il Va bene. Ok, grazie. Thank <laughs> you. 